polygamy. What love is this? We're glad you're here tonight for our show. My name is Doris Hansen. I'm the host for the program. Tonight we are not broadcasting live from Salt Lake City because tonight's program is a pre- Mormon apostle Wilfred Woodruff's first wife's name was Phoebe Woodruff. She was asked one day to defend the principle of plural marriage in a mass meeting to Mormon women. A few days later, an old friend of hers met with her and she said, How is it that you've changed your views so suddenly about polygamy? I thought you hated it and loathed it. I've not changed, was her response, <coughs> Phoebe said. I loathe the unclean thing with the strength of my nature, but I have suffered all that a woman can endure. I am old and helpless. I would rather stand up anywhere and say anything commanded of me than to be turned out of my home in my old age, which surely would happen if I refused to obey. So Wilfred Woodruff's first wife was forced to brag about polygamy with the threat of being kicked out of her own home. And so I continue to ask the question, polygamy, what love is this? We welcome you to our show tonight. My name is Doris Hansen, and I am the host for the program, and we do hope that you enjoy your time here. Uh, we do talk about polygamy here, and do we talk about all that's negative? Well, we do try and tell it like it is, and when we talk about historical events, we try to tell it like it was. This is a live broadcast from Salt Lake City, Utah, and it is a telephone call-in program, and about halfway through the program, we'll open up the phone lines and invite our viewers to call in and ask your questions and make your comments and voice your concerns over the issue of polygamy. I would like to remind our viewers, polygamous viewers or others, to go to the webpage, shieldandrefuge.org, and you can find information about polygamy. You might find uh, articles there of interest to you. Uh, you can uh, find stories of people who have left polygamy groups and have never regretted it, have productive lives, and you'll find the true biblical plan of salvation there as well. I also want to urge all those, uh, perhaps in, uh, in a polygamy group, if you're being abused in any way, if you're being forced or coerced into something you don't want to do and you know isn't right, you can contact someone off of the uh, web page contact page and you can get sensitive and confidential help if you need help. <clears throat> if you are interested in leaving a, a group or just have questions that you would like to have answered, please uh, give us a call and you'll get the help you need. Those in polygamy who would like to be involved with the program but you're afraid to call in that your voice or your name will be recognized, just remember all you have to do is call and say uh, you want to remain anonymous and the telephone operator will take it from there and you can ask your question and no one will know it was you. Our web page is about polygamy.com. You can find future programming listed there as well as our past programs you can watch on streaming video. Someone outside of the area who cannot get the show, just tell them to go there and they can watch all of the programs um, from the RSS feed. Our email address is tv at aboutpolygamy.com where we invite you to give us your comments on the program. And uh, if you need charts or resources or uh, references that we use, just email us and let us know. If you have confidential information you'd like to let us talk about, email us, tv at aboutpolygamy.com. I'd like to remind you of the campaign that Brian Mackard is doing with his book. He released uh, the book uh, he wrote on his life in the FLDS community is called Illegitimate. And um, he has offered to give his book to anyone signed by himself, the author, him and David C. Cook Publishing are offering, making this special offer uh, for anyone who wants to donate $200 or more to the Hagar Fund, which is the legal uh, fund for those escaping polygamy or also the fund needed for everyday day-to-day -day expenses that these people have when they leave. 
And so if you're interested in doing that, <clears throat> contact us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com or you can go to the shieldandrefuge.org uh, webpage and get the mailing address. And at any rate, we can give you the f full, f fuller information on that. Excuse me. I'd like to report on last Monday's support group. We did have our discussion group. We've been talking about that for about a month. We did have the group <clears throat> meeting last Monday evening at 630. Uh, we had four people come. We had a good time of sharing. Um, there was someone there who was still in a polygamy group and it was interesting to talk to that person and get some viewpoints that we probably hadn't heard before. Uh, we are continuing to have these discussion groups the third Monday of every month at 630. Anyone who's interested in coming, it's a low key, it's a safe place to be and talk. And so we invite you to contact us, tv at aboutpolygamy.com, if you are interested in, in attending the next discussion group. I also uh, would like to talk about um, the last night's book signing event. And so to do that, I'll need to introduce our special guest, who is Susan Schmidt. She has been um, threatening to come since June. <laughs> and... If you could recall, she was going to be here in June, and she got sick and couldn't come, and we had her scheduled for July, and tragedy happened, and she couldn't come, and then last week she got sick again, and we were afraid uh -huh. she couldn't come again, but uh, God is gracious and healed her up, and she's almost back to normal, and Susan, welcome Thank for you. Uh, being on the show and for going through all you've gone through to get here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited to be here, Doris. I really am. Well, you're Thanks for inviting some. me. You're going to have some interesting things to tell our viewers. I hope so. Uh, let's talk about uh, the book signing last night because it was for you to get to know the people at the mm -hmm. Springville Bookstore and, um, and for them also to get to know this ministry a little better. So what did you think about it? Um, I thought that the people were absolutely wonderful. It was nice to see Christians who had come out of Mormonism. Uh -huh. There was quite a few of them there. There was. Um, they welcomed me and, and were excited to have, <coughs> excuse me, I'm still, she's still popping. singing a little bit. <laughs> um, I was excited to have my book there. My book, it's called His Favorite Wife. Uh huh. And it, uh, it's about my, uh, history of being raised in a polygamist organization mm -hmm. and being married into one as a young woman and, uh, finally leaving it and eventually finding Christ as finding my Savior. Christ as your Savior and your healer. Yes. And I thought we had a good showing last night as well. With yes. Some delightful people that we Absolutely. met. Absolutely, wonderful conversations. people. Yeah, we mm -hmm. had fun, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, we did. We enjoyed, really enjoyed it. We, I think we all did. And I'd like to again ca thank uh, the owners of the bookstore, Kent and Connie Lowe, for their graciousness and the ladies who brought in the refreshments uh, and the good coffee. It was just all fun. So maybe we can do that again sometime. Um, Susan, before we get started on the interview, we want to talk about your life as the sixth wife of Verlin LeBaron. But before we get started on the interview, I think that our viewers may want to hear a little bit about our trip to El Dorado. Okay. We, um, Susan and I went to El Dorado together in April when the YFC Ranch uh, rescue attempt took place. Mm -hmm. And we were down there for... Eight days. Yes, we were. Eight days. Um, why don't you just say what you think about it, and, and I can say what I think about it. We can go on with the, with the interview if you'd like to reminisce a little. Um, it was an amazing trip. Um, I don't know how else to say it. I felt so um, blessed to be included in that trip, to be able to go down, uh, just to be able to pray for the women that was caught, that were in the compound, that, were, that had been kicked out of the compound or brought out of the compound, mm -hmm. uh, to meet the Christian people in El Dorado that were um, praying for these guys. Were, they were so involved, hands-on involved in, in trying to care for them um, mm -hmm. once they had been brought out of the a, compound. A big job. It was, a, it was a huge job. And um, Doris and I both, having come out of polygamous backgrounds, we felt like we could possibly... Um, be of assistance somehow. Mm -hmm. Encouragement to, and assistance yes. and, and um, pass on information about polygamy to those yeah. who didn't the, 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 the know people much about of the, that, that area really had no background whatsoever in anything to do with, with fundamentalist Mormonism or polygamy. They were um, at a loss of how to deal with the people out of mm -hmm. El Dorado. So we felt like we could possibly help them to understand 
And I believe we did. When we were asked to talk to the First Baptist Church mm -hmm. uh, morning, Sunday morning and Sunday evening, yes. they showed the DVD. And then one of the other churches in midweek, plus the Lions Club. The yes, Lions Club? Lions Club. We went to the Lions Club. And uh, there were so many questions, uh, the interesting questions that they had, they, t questions that no one around here would ask because we just know mm -hmm. everyone around here knows the culture. But they didn't, and they were totally appalled uh, of the treatment that the women and the children get in some of these yes. polygamy communities. Mm -hmm. And do our viewers know what DVD you're talking about? The Lifting the Veil of Polygamy. I've talked about it before. I hope you. I hope they know. They probably do. <laughs> <laughs> for for the new viewers, the Lifting the Veil of Polygamy DVD is available on the website that I talked about. Well, I'd like to uh, mention the El Dorado um, part that I enjoyed. We ha we had the m the most gracious host, Southern hospitality at its best. Mm -hmm. And I would like to thought to to be uh, thankful to Rick and Vicki. They were our hosts and we we invaded their home for eight days. They never saw us before. They didn't know who we were. Even when we got to the airport, they didn't know who we were. And we were late. And we were two hours late yeah. or something like that. And so they still waited around for us and they were the most gracious hosts. And thank you, Vicki, for introducing me to fried pickles. I had never heard of them before, <laughs> and I loved them. So anyway, uh, we had a good time. We did go to the ranch. Uh, there were two young men at the ranch. We stopped mm -hmm. and talked to them, uh, Susan and I did. And I, uh, we showed them the book, Is Polygamy Biblical? And we gave them each one of those books. We told them we were praying for them, and they were quite surprised that other people that didn't know them were praying for them. And uh, as they walked away, we said goodbye. And as they walked away, they were both had their heads in the book. And so we're just praying for them that those two men found out that mm -hmm. polygamy indeed is not required for salvation, uh, but that salvation is a gift of God uh, through Jesus Christ. Um, well, Susan, let's, let's talk about your life in <coughs> the LeBaron group. Um, before, before we get started in the questions, maybe you would like to take a little bit of time to maybe educate our viewers a bit on the LeBaron group, a little bit about them, set, kind of set the foundation so that when we get into your life, they'll have a cleaner understanding of it. Okay, I'll do my best. How did your family first become involved with? My, uh, my mother and dad were from a long line of um, LDS people. They were on both sides of the family, um, LDS all the way back, generations. Clear back, yeah. yes. And my mom and dad had nine children. I was the seventh of nine. And we lived in, um, oh, sort of southern Utah in the Panguitch area, I believe, at the time. Mm -hmm. And my mom and dad were somewhat disillusioned with the LDS church through different changes in the doctrine that had happened. And, and, um, and my dad was not happy with some of I think it was the change in the garment that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back with oh, my dad. Yeah. yeah, and at that time he was um, perfectly um, willing and ready for missionaries from a brand new fundamentalist church that was called the Church of the Firstborn to come into our home and to speak to my mom and my dad. And um, the, these missionaries were from the LeBaron Church that is stationed in um, in. Chihuahua, Mexico. It's called Colonial LeBaron. And so sure enough, my mom and dad joined um, Joel LeBaron's church and moved their family. By the time I was six, we were living in Colonial LeBaron in Mexico. Mm. So it was a small, new, fundamentalist Mormon church. Uh, of course, they lived polygamy, as most fundamentalist Mormon churches do. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't long before my father took a plural wife. I believe I was eight when I... Uh, was introduced to my new Mama Maria. <laughs> and she soon was adding to my father's brood. And uh, I had little half uh, siblings running yeah. around. Okay. So. How did your mother take? You How know, you my, my mother accepted Maria very well from, from my memory, but of course I was, I was young. Mm -hmm. But Maria lived, we lived in adobe houses. We, uh, Colonial Baron was very primitive. Uh, we lived in adobe homes and dirt dirt roads, bumpy dirt roads, and uh, cactus desert all mm -hmm. around us. 
We had no running water, no electricity. We used outdoor toilets and washed our clothes on a scrub board. Oh my, that's but it was it was totally ago. normal to me. I, I didn't see anything wrong with it. I had I had a great time mm -hmm. being raised well, like that. It was an adventure for you. You it were was, just such a young one. Right? Yeah, and you know I don't remember ever hearing my mother complain. Although she came out of a comfortable home in Utah and moved down to these type of conditions, I don't remember her complaining. Okay, good. That's good so. that you you didn't catch the complaining bug then. No. <laughs> Okay, um, very often, as, as you know, I talk about polygamy a lot, and I know you do too. I do. That's just part of what we are. Yes. And um, I know when I talk to people about the group I came from, or I, I know someone from the FLDS group, or I know someone from the LeBaron group, and I, I mention the name LeBaron, and people go, <gasps> almost, you know, imperceptibly, they'll back up a little bit, like there's fear yes. in their eyes just from the mention of that name. Do you find that a lot yourself? And explain to our viewers who may I do. not know why. I do. Um, I guess we were we were probably the most violent of the fundamentalist Mormon groups. And when I say we, there actually became two LeBaron groups. One was uh, Joel LeBaron, who claimed to be the prophet, his group. And he had a brother named Herbal, who... Uh, split away from Joel's group and formed his own group and it was called the Church of the Lamb of God. And Ervil became a very violent leader. Oh my goodness, it's such an such a But that's why people would get bad long before. story. It is a long story and there were murders and blood atonement yes. and yeah. and um, a lot of murders and jail and court and yes. all of that and so I um, I married Joel and Ervil LeBaron's younger brother Verlin when I was I was a week past my fifteenth birthday when I became Verlin's sixth wife. He was thirty eight and I was um, barely fifteen. He was a stranger to me, pretty much. I didn't know him well, and I certainly didn't know his family well. And he moved me away from my comfort zone in Colonial LeBaron to the new uh, colony that uh, was being um, pioneered on the Baja California Peninsula. And it was shortly after I married Verlin that, that Ervil split away from Joel's church, taking part of our church fellowship with him. And he began writing threatening letters to um, Joel LeBaron's uh, group, stating that he wanted us to leave Joel, follow him, he wanted Joel to uh, admit that he was the real prophet, that Ervil was the real prophet. And um, when that didn't happen, uh, well, Ervil threatened us with uh, having our blood spilt. So uh, we, we, at first we didn't take him seriously, but as time went on, we realized that he was very serious. He had his brother, our prophet, murdered by... Um, what we called, what I called his right-hand man. Mm -hmm. It was a man named uh, Dan Jordan. Mm -hmm. So Joel, our prophet, was killed. And from what I had understood, this, this, this man was to have been with us until Jesus came again. So it was a, a major shock to me and to others in the church to have Joel gone. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, right after he was killed, looking to the skies and, and along with other people and thinking, well, this must be the end of the world. We're expecting the end of the world to happen. Either that or Joel's going to be raised up again as Jesus was. Mm. Mm. And of course, when that didn't happen, we buried our prophet. Mm -hmm. And uh, my husband, Joel's younger brother, uh, the, the leadership of the church was thrust upon him. Mm -hmm. He wasn't really wanting it, mm -hmm. but he had to pick up and, and carry the banner forward, you might say. So what's going on down there right now? In, uh, in, the, in the Colonial LeBaron? Well, Colonial LeBaron is still um, very much alive and well. Um, I believe that they don't live polygamy quite as, there, there's not quite as much polygamy that goes on in Colonial LeBaron anymore as there was when I was there, um, and that was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a Christian influence there now, though, isn't there? There's some yes, Bible studies there, there, and... there is. Um, a Calvary Chapel pastor and his wife that now live in Colonial LeBaron, and I'm excited about that yeah, because absolutely. there's uh, there's you know they're they're doing Bible studies and Sunday school and 
uh, from what I understand, many of the people from Colonial LeBaron are actually attending. But and this is the back. first time in the history of Colonial LeBaron that there has been a non-Mormon-based uh, church wow. in Colonial LeBaron. Good. So. Answered a lot of prayer. Yes. Well, uh, Susan, you were... Uh, Verlin LeBaron's sixth wife. I was. When you married him, and you, like you said, just barely 15 years old, just mm -hmm. still a child. Uh, how long after you married him did he start looking for another wife? It was about four months later. Four months? Four months. You're supposed to still be on your honeymoon. Well, uh, that's not the way it went. <laughs> How'd that make you feel when you saw him going after something? And you were his sixth wife, so yes, he was I going was. after number seven at that point. You know, my husband was still very much. Um, pretty much a stranger to me and I kept wondering when am I going to get to spend time with the new husband that I barely know mm -hmm. and so when I found out that he was courting a childhood friend of mine mm. and and uh, I found it out without him telling me about it I happened to uh, catch them Peek together. Peek out the window and saw yeah, the car or something. I did. I, I peeked out the window of the little trailer that I was living in and saw him sitting in a car kind of all cozied up to my friend Lily and it, it was very devastating for mm -hmm. me. Oh my goodness, it was a bad deal. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I really found out what jealousy was at that point. Mm -hmm. Wow, that would be devastating, especially when you don't even have the companionship of, of your husband yet uh, right. as a true husband. And, and you know, when I confronted him about it, for him to explain to me that it was none of my business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realized that nothing my husband did was any of my was business. None of your business. The women were not much value. No, no, we weren't. And, and yet that was very much accepted by us. Yeah, well, you didn't know any different. Your culture, and you're, you're trained into it, you're conditioned yes. for it. We figured that God was a man, and he was partial to men. Uh huh. And um, that was That's absolutely normal and natural. That's what I thought, different groups, same thing. Well, if you don't mind I, my masking, I'm not going to ask for any um, nitty-gritty detail about the marriage ceremony, but I'm kind of curious. Yeah. Uh, you didn't have a temple. Of course, we didn't either in the group I was uh, mm -hmm. from, the Kingston group. And so they held their, their ceilings in private homes, at least when I was there. They right, or in that. the church. And um, what did they... Did, in the marriage ceremony, did you have to give away your husband? How did, they, how did that work in your particular group? Um, most of the ceremonies that I attended, my own included, uh -huh. um, a prior, a, the first wife or the second wife, uh, and in my case, Verlin's second wife, Irene, took my <laughs> hand and placed it in her husband's hand. And that was, she gave me to him. Okay. So, so there only had to be one wife that agreed <coughs> to the marriage, not all of the wives. <coughs> oh, excuse me. You um, know, I, I, don't, I don't know that any wife really had to agree to the marriage. Um, I don't think that Irene particularly agreed to the marriage. I don't think that she was extremely happy about it, but she was doing her duty. She agreed to agree. Yes. Yeah. What about the hierarchy? Did Verlin have a hierarchy in the, the pecking order in the wives? I, I asked Mary Mackert that when she was here, and mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious if, if that was the way with you. I don't really think that there was a pecking order, not in Verlin's family. He, he tried very hard to be fair with his wives. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel that his first wife, Charlotte, who was basically his age, she um, had been to college. I don't think she was a graduate, but she had some education. Um, she was much better at business than any of the rest of us were. Mm -hmm. I think that he relied on her more. Mm -hmm. I think that she was more his partner in trying to keep his family afloat mm -hmm. than the rest of us were. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't necessarily mean that she was his favorite, but that he relied on her more. She was more of a partner to him. And I think that I found that to be true in most plural marriages, that the husband picks one wife that he feels the closest to and that he can lean on more and rely on more. And that, wa that woman, I guess, um, she, she knows it mm -hmm. and, and she lets the other wives know it too. Yeah, and that's natural, that would happen. And again, she was his first wife and mm -hmm. so they had more time together alone right. without any of the other peripheral events. And yet your book is entitled His Favorite Wife. Were you 
his favorite, by the time you came along and you entered his heart and life, were you his favorite wife? I don't think that I was um, at first, and I'm not really sure that I ever really was. I think that Verlin was more insecure with me than he was his other wives. Um, I was never content like his other wives were. I remember some of his wives seemed to, uh, they, not, they didn't really have any thoughts of leaving him, whereas I had thoughts of leaving him constantly, and he knew it. Were any of them as young as you when he married them? No, I was his definitely his youngest wife. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure glad he didn't have one younger than me. I mean, I was uh -huh. still a child. Oh, you certainly were. I was a child, but I was being <clears throat> treated like a woman. Mm -hmm. And expected to act like one. And expected to act one. like one, yeah. yes. I'd like to, to remind our viewers that we will be opening our phone lines in a few minutes, and our telephone number is 801-973-8820. That's 801-973-TV20. Um, <clears throat> would you, when Mary was here and I interviewed her, I asked her if she was his favorite wife. And she said, yes, she was. She was definitely his favorite wife. And I said, oh, well, that's nice. And she said, no, it's not. It's not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> then all the attention's on you and you want to stay in the background, you know. And do, uh, wh what about you? Is that, would you uh, react that same way? Would it be a good thing or a bad thing to be his favorite wife? In reality, I think it really depends on your relationship with your husband. Uh -huh. If you if you really love him and want him to love you back, you know, uh -huh. then yeah, it would be it would be nice to have that knowledge. But at the same time, when you're in a polygamous relationship and you have like uh, such as I was, mm -hmm. where our husband was gone as much as our husband was gone, mm -hmm. he was the leader of the church. We lived in Mexico. He had to either work out in the United States or he was on missions out into the United States. So he was gone for two and sometimes three months at a time to where we as wives had to rely on one another just to get along, mm -hmm. just, just to just make to it. Just to make it. We were extremely poor. Mm -hmm. we, we lived very, very frugally. Um, if I was out of sugar, I would run to one of my sister wives and she would supply, you know, if she had it. Mm -hmm. We helped each other with our children. We helped each other with the laundry. And, you know, we didn't, I didn't get along that well with all of his wives. And when our husband was home, there was a lot more contention than when he was gone. But I cared for his other wives. Mm -hmm. I felt, I saw their you knew suffering. You what they were going through, too. I you did. were all suffering the same way. I felt their loneliness. I yeah. saw their loneliness because I knew it myself. Yeah. And every time he took a new wife, and he took, what, ten? Mm -hmm. Ten yes. total? Uh -huh. And every time he took a new wife, that took away from your time with him. It did. And their time with him as well yes. diminished. You know, when Verlin mm -hmm. married the girl that he married right after me, and her name was Lily, um, I just, at that point, I'd been a part of his family for four months. And I, I, when I first married him, I was shocked that a leader of the church, that his family would live in such poverty. Yeah. You know, I guess I kind of expected things would be a little nicer than they yeah, were. Yeah, you know? you'd think so. <laughs> yeah, and so I was really extremely shocked at how uh, how much we didn't have, yeah, you know, yeah. and the fact that I never had any money. I didn't have money for a Coke if I wanted one, Right. you know. Yeah. So it really bothered me that he was marrying more girls when he obviously didn't have the time to spend with the wives that he had or the means to support or us. Or the money to support you, right. Um, during this time of pain that you're going through, and there's a lot of emotional pain. I, by the way, I've read Susan's book. Um, it's a very good book. It, I, I was in tears so many times reading her book because of the pain that I, I experienced. Some of it myself in poverty and the home I was raised in, but ne nothing compared to the way they were living down in Mexico. Um, but it really made me feel for Susan and for all of those people that were living the way they were living. And so my next question is, how did you view God as being the architect of this lifestyle um, and the obvious low esteem that he had for women? God was a stranger to me. He seemed unreachable. I wasn't really sure I wanted a relationship with him, not to mention the fact that I didn't know that, that such a thing was a possibility. Mm -hmm. God seemed um, totally unattainable. Jesus, on the other hand, um, 
we were taught that Jesus was our elder brother. Mm -hmm. And I could relate to him more. Mm -hmm. I felt a kinship with Jesus. God scared me. I knew that we were supposed to pray to him, and I did, but it was not a heartfelt prayer. It was a, a ritualistic uh, thank you for the food type, keep us mm -hmm. safe through the night type prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's not one that I, I felt from the heart whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that there was such a thing as a personal relationship with God, mm -hmm. not until I left Colonial LeBaron and left my husband and several years later became a Christian. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought uh, God was awfully cruel and, and heartless and f unloving, absolutely incapable of love, as was my opinion of God when, as I was going through the heartache and cruelty mm -hmm. of, of the life I was raised in. You know, um, my opinion of God was He was a man because that's what we were taught. Mm -hmm. And in the society that I was in, the men were the important gender, big time. The men were the ones that would get together and have their meetings, and they were important, and, and they would run the church, and they would run their families, and they would run everything. And we, as women, stayed back, wiped runny noses, changed diapers, and cooked beans. Behind the scenes. We were the behind the scenes support for the important people. Mm -hmm. And God was one of those important people, and I knew that once we got to heaven, that all the men would gather together and they would plan their worlds that they were going to create. And we, as women, would continue to be the behind the scenes support group for the men. Mm -hmm. yeah. So heaven wasn't a big deal to me. I, I know that I didn't want to go to hell and I was constantly afraid that I might end up there, mm -hmm. but I wasn't really excited about going to heaven. Well, you're not when it's a polygamy heaven that we learn about. Uh, we have a phone call here from Amy in South Jordan. Amy, I'm going to take your call in just a moment, but uh, there's another question here, off-the-air question. Does Susan remember Maud? Uh, that must be Maud LeBaron. Uh, that's the only Maud that I knew. There was a Maudy, but yes, I remember Maud LeBaron. If, if this is the Maud you're talking about, it was Verlin's mother, and she was my mother-in-law. She was my piano teacher from the time I was a small girl. And uh, I remember her very well. Yes. Okay. Well, someone out there must uh, must know her as well. Yeah. Okay. Let's take Amy's call. Hello, Amy. Hello. Hello. You're on the air. Welcome to the show. Oh, hello. Hello. You're on the air. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh huh. Um, first of all, my heart just goes out to both of you for what you had to go through. Well, thank you for calling, and Amy. And um, I, my question is, um, do you want to turn down your TV? I think it's interfering with your phone call. Sure, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh -huh. um, my question is, what does someone who is not involved in polygamy or has ever been involved in polygamy and who's, who's more mainstream, um, how does someone help these women and children? The polygamous women and children? Uh-huh. Well, um, first of all, they need to be, they need to know that people care for them. Uh, the women, like Susan was just talking, um, they often feel like they're second or third class citizens and they need mm -hmm. to be um, appreciated. They ne need to know that they are valued and that the children are valued, uh, that God values them, uh, and that they are not made to be uh, breeding. Uh, persons, but that they are made uh, for other purposes of God that He would have for their life. And how do how does one go about that? I mean, how do you reach out to these people? Do you, are there addresses? I mean, how do you contact these people? <laughs> um, I've read so many books recently about um, different circumstances, and the, the newest books that have been out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, Escape was one of them that I read, and a couple other ones, and I just. My heart goes out to yes. you and to the to the these women who and children who are so oppressed by these men, and it, it's heartbreaking to me. Amy, my suggestion to you, if you really want to help, uh, more than anything, pray for them. Prayer is a mighty tool, and it's the first thing that we should do for people that we 
um, that we uh, want to help. Uh, pray for them. Encourage uh, them just as we encourage, just as I was not encouraged to study the scriptures. Uh, the Bible was a stranger to me. Um, I didn't trust it because I was taught not to trust it. And women need to uh, get into the Word of God themselves and right. find out what God teaches. Absolutely. They need to learn that God loves them, that He wants happiness for them. He wants them to live in joy. He wants to be their friend besides being their father. So there's nothing physically that you can do really as far as providing a safe haven or you know, making yourself available to help these people? Um, is, is there nothing that you can actually do other than pray? Well, first of all, like, like um, Susan said, prayer is very powerful and effective. However, um, if you want to contact uh, someone off of the webpage, shieldandrefuge.org, uh, you can get in personal conversation with how helps can be done. But please know that some of these polygamous communities are um, totally closed to people who might want to come in and uh, talk to them. And so they're not really not open. Unless they reach out to you first and with an open mind, you probably couldn't go into them and talk to them. But we do get uh, contact with them, and if you want to contact someone off the webpage of shieldandrefuge.org, we might be able to co communicate some information there. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Good Bye, night. Amy. Appreciate it. Uh -huh. Okay, line two, uh, Aaron from Salt Lake City. Aaron? Uh, yes. Yes, you're on the air, Aaron. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, do you not advocate that these uh, women that leave or men or whoever, leave the uh, fundamentalist uh, polygamous groups, uh, is it, it doesn't appear that you're really uh, for them going and joining the LDS church, of course, which is a separate uh, organization. You prefer they go join a Christian evangelical group or whatever, or is there some reason that you can't be, leave a FLDS and then go join the LDS and not practice polygamy. <laughs> and then uh, the second question uh, is, uh, it's just real quick, I, I see a lot of these women that come on your show there, they seem so unhappy, and maybe they just had a long day, <laughs> but uh, they see so, seem so unhappy, and yet there's these other women that are in polygamy that are practicing attorneys or they're out working in the community and they wouldn't have any other life and really advocate the life and uh, think that it's, uh, you know, wonderful, it's great. So I'm just uh, wondering, uh, are former polygamist women generally depressed or, or what? Well, Aaron, first of all, when women leave, when anyone leaves a polygamy group, their choice of whether they go to the LDS church or evangelical church or no church is their choice, absolutely. And I find that there's a good variety of, uh, of um, where they end up going, where different people end up going. So there's, there's not a particular plan that I'm aware of. Uh, it's their choice, of course. Um, now, as far as the sadness of the polygamy women on this show, I would have to disagree with you. Every woman that I have had on this program has been extremely happy women, and I will let Susan speak for herself. <laughs> well, tell her to smile. Then. <laughs> <laughs> well, Erin, uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm smiling on the inside if I'm not smiling on the outside. <laughs> I, am, uh, I, 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 I am very uh, happy. I've seen these women sitting around the kitchen table. Some guy, I don't even remember where he's at, but there was three or four or five of them, and they were uh, touting the sisterhood was great, and they loved each other, and they were very happy, and uh, it seemed genuine. Now, maybe he, the guy was threatening them with uh, a torture chamber he had downstairs or some kind of uh, waterboarding or something, but they seemed to be uh, happy in that lifestyle, but you seem to be making the case that uh, the only w there's only one way you can be as a polygamous wife, and that's terribly unhappy and uh, abused, abused and uh, terrible life. Well, Aaron, there are uh, there are women that I've met in polygamy who have seemed to be happy, um, and there's been children that I've met in polygamy groups that seem to be happy. 
and I'm glad for that. But to be honest with you, the percentage is rare. And to be further honest with you, that doesn't make it right, even if they are happy. It doesn't make it right. The, they claim it's God's command. They, sure. they claim that it's I mean, God's program for salvation. Uh, studies or anything. Uh, oh, yes. Or, we, where you show that uh, women in the polygamous groups are less happier or... Uh, uh, than the, the women that are out. I mean, they haven't done any interviews or the university well, I'm, I'm talking, hasn't done Aaron, any Aaron, I'm talking about my own experience. That, have I'm talking about that my own experience I've had with many, many different women from different groups. So, and so it's just anecdotal. It's just what you yourself has experienced. Then. And articles and, and from other people. It's, yeah. it's That'd be an interesting study, you know, to... Uh, to see because the public, I mean, we all seem to be confused that uh, it's impossible to be happy and be a, a polygamist. And well, generally it's impossible to be happy and share your spouse. And it's generally impossible to have 50 children and not be able to be fathered properly by your father. And that's based on what, could you give me a citation? Well, what if, what if your father had had 50 kids? How often would you get to see him? How often would you sit on his lap? How often would you be fathered properly and nourished by him? Mm -hmm. Well, but I'm, I'm talking, I'm asking if you have any sociological studies that have done those comparative analysis over uh, cohort <laughs> studies, uh, future studies. I think it would be very difficult to do that because polygamous people are generally very quiet. Very they, secretive. They won't talk about oh, themselves So neither much. one of them really have any studies. No, show anything no. no, but we have real life uh, experiences. You, uh, would you ever have anyone on that's uh, in polygamy and that's uh, uh, a woman, uh, a group of women come in and uh, tell you, uh, give the other side of the story? Is it just one sided all the time? This is pretty much a one sided show. I see. Yeah. I see. It's kind of like that. Uh, O'Reilly factor. It's kind of the, like our prerogative uh, to do this, yes. One way or the other. Uh, it's it's our prerogative to do this, yes. There's no uh, fair fair time. Well, I think it's very fair. Well, okay, it's well, carry fair. on. Thank you. Good luck to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh huh. You bet. Bye. Bye. Okay, is Benjamin Franklin Johnson a prophet of that group, meaning LeBaron, I suppose? And did he claim the third level of the priesthood? That's for you. Benjamin Franklin Johnson was uh, a great, great, great grandfather to my husband, Verlin. He was a contemporary of Joseph Smith um, back in, I believe, Nauvoo. Um, he claimed to be an adopted son of Joseph Smith, and the LeBarons claim that that's where they got their priesthood was from Benjamin, through Benjamin F. Johnson, that Benjamin F. Johnson received it from Joseph Smith and it was passed down to his grandson, who passed it to his grandson, who passed it to uh, my, my husband Verlin's father, Daryl LeBaron, who gave it to his son, Joel. And that's where Benjamin Franklin Johnson fits into the LeBaron scheme of things. Whether he, uh, the third level of the priesthood, I assume you mean the, the, the one mighty and strong or the Melchizedek priesthood, is that what you're, I, I assume that's what you're talking about. And, uh, I, yes, he did. He claimed to have it. Okay, let's take line one, Liesl from Ogden. Hello, Liesl. Yes. You're on the air. Welcome to the show. Thank you. What's your question? My question is, and it kind of touched, um, was touched on in your previous call with the gentleman, and that is, I don't think you need any real studies to be able to look at this, and that is, you look at the predominantly hardships that the women are put upon. But the men, they're, they've got a lot of wives fighting between them, a lot of children fighting for their time, and a lot of poverty that they're working on. Mm -hmm. Are they happy on a day-to-day -day basis living life like this? Are you talking about the men? Yeah. Are the men happy? Uh, yeah, the men happy. You look at the women, they're definitely not happy. But the men, why are they doing this? They're doing it because they believe that they have to do it in order to go to the highest degree of glory in heaven and become a god themselves. But do you feel like in the day-to-day -day running of their families, they're experiencing any happiness? I mean, the women definitely are not. 
and the men were on the show. I don't think you need any studies, though, to be able to live in this life like you guys have and, <laughs> and see, is there day-to-day -day happiness there? I don't think we need any studies either. I agree with you. Um, uh, no. I, th I think there might be more men who, who would say they were content than women, and yet we did a poll, and a, a, it wasn't a scientific poll, but we asked for people to call in and, uh, and say whether or not they would continue to live poly polygamy if they learned beyond a shadow of a doubt that it wasn't required for salvation. And unanimously, the answer was a no, and the, and the first caller was from a man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't seem surprising at all when you, um, you know, read the books and you hear yeah. the testimonies of life as it's lived there. And I just wondered if it was kind of felt maybe the same way among the men. I don't see how they can be happy when their children and wives aren't happy. Well, I don't see how they could either. Um, uh, but it, it just isn't, a, it's not a normal life. It certainly isn't the life that God has planned out for us. Well, I guess my question was, and I completely agree, I just wondered if you had, if you felt like your husbands were happy. Did they, did they seem happy living a day-to-day -day life like that? I would say that my husband was very unhappy. Um, he had more, more trouble than any one man deserves to have, and he knew it. He did not know his children well. He didn't have a relationship with any of his children. He had uh, constantly very unhappy wives, very lonely wives. He couldn't possibly take care of them in the way that he would have liked to take care of them. And I remember it was not too long after I left my husband. Well, it was actually a couple of years, and I, I, was, uh, I had remarried by this time. And my, my current husband, his name was Dennis, um, he met Verlin. And he asked Verlin, how could you have done this to someone like Susan? How could you have married all of these women? What's wrong with you, man? You know. And Verlin said, you know, do you think that it wouldn't have been easier for me to have had one wife and to have and be able to come home every night to that one wife? I do this because I believe that God required it. That's what I was taught. Joseph Smith taught this to us. And that's why I live it. Yeah. And I think that's about the well, way. Well, I appreciate that. I had read a book, maybe it was your sister wife that was an Irene. Yes. And um, the life that, that she lived and that you lived along there with him, that's not happiness for anyone. And, no. And couldn't be by him. You don't need a study to, to be able to see all that. So I appreciate your, your answering that. Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for your call. Okay, we have a question. Explain the difference between spiritual marriage and legal marriage. The spiritual marriage is what uh, a man and a woman does when they're going into a polygamous uh, union, mm -hmm. whereas the legal marriage is when the first man, the man and his first wife will get married with the, birth, with the marriage certificate and legally register their marriage. The spiritual marriage is the one is supposedly uh, valid in heaven and that this man will get uh, both the legal wife and the spiritual wives mm -hmm. as his wives in the celestial kingdom when they die for eternity. And then we have another question. Is it okay to claim social wel welfare for each wife? <laughs> Is it okay? <laughs> it's going on all the time. Uh, you know, It seems to be pretty prevalent. <laughs> uh, it's all a matter of uh, who you ask, whether it's okay. Yeah. Personally, uh, I think that Doris will agree with me. Uh, it's, it's not okay. Um, it, it's a lifestyle that so many people don't agree with, and yet the taxpayers are paying the, the bill for them to be able to live that lifestyle. And, of course, we don't want the women and the children to suffer in hunger either. So it's kind of like a Pandora's box or uh, Cash 22 or whatever you might call it. That would have been a good uh, subject to bring up with uh, Aaron, our caller, a little while ago. <laughs> okay, let's talk to Penny. <laughs> Hello, Penny. Hello. Hello, you're on the air. Well, I'm calling to uh, comment on Aaron's statement that the women... Uh, the guests on your show that have been in polygamy, that they don't seem like they're happy. Well, I would just, I don't think it's realistic for them to be happy talking about a very serious and a very somber subject. Sad part so of their lives. If you were life. to ask them uh, about their lives now, 
personally what they're and what they've experienced since leaving it, then that would be a whole different story. But I just didn't think that was reality to expect these women to be looking happy and acting happy when they were talking about such a somber subject. And when you read some of their books and hear some of their stories, they went through living hell for years and years and abuse. It is a very sad part of their life. Yeah. Uh, but there's a, a happy ending that we have with the guests that we bring on the program, and that is the fact uh, that we'll ask Susan for right now how she found her joy after leaving her polygamous situation. Would you like to tell how you did that when you found out that there really is uh, a God who loves you and loves women. Is that your question, Penny? Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good night. Bye. Why don't you tell us how, we're getting close to the end of the program, we don't want to miss out on this part of your story. Okay. Um, I found that Jesus was the answer. I, don't, I, I really don't know quite how to explain it all because it's such a long story and how to condense it. But um, I found that I could trust Jesus, that he was exactly what the scriptures said that he was, that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. Uh, I found that my sins were forgiven I was taught throughout my life that my sins, after I was baptized at eight years old, that my sins were on my own shoulders. And I was constantly trying to level, do, do enough good things in my life to make up for all the sins and all the bad things that I'd done in my life. And I was never sure whether it was ever going to level out. I never knew that heaven was mine, ever. I was always worried and wondering whether I was good enough to go to heaven. And when I found out that I didn't have to be good, that it was not whether I was good enough, but it was what Jesus had done for me on the cross, mm -hmm. that he had completely paid my way into heaven, and that all I had to do was accept him, trust him, have faith in him, that I could be assured that eternal life was mine, that's when I found my joy. And it has never gone away. It has filled my life. I am so ecstatic because my children know this too, and I would not trade this knowledge and this happiness for anything. And Jesus feels it. He absolutely. absolutely feels it. And, and the, I think the, the joy on my part when I found out about this is when you're in a heavy works-oriented salvation plan, mm -hmm. And it just is, it clouded your, your life day after day, year after year after year, and you don't know any better. Um, and yet it's an awful works situation that they're asking for. And right. then you find that you're saved by grace, not by works. Um, so no man can boast. That's right. And that, that heaviness is lifted. And Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are ever heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's right. Take and that's what it's all about. On. And he takes that burden. And once I completely. found that out, the burden was lifted from my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And it, there's just, there's nothing that compares to it. Right. And I would never want to go back. Right. And I think one of the uh, sad things about polygamy groups, uh, it, well, actually the, the Joseph Smith doctrine is that men or a man or your husband has the power over your resurrection and over your salvation. Yeah. And uh, that just isn't true. Jesus Christ is the Savior, not your husband. Whether you're a, a monogamist <laughs> or a polygamist, your Savior and your resurrection power is in Jesus Christ alone. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody that can supersede or take that away from Him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we have um, two questions up there on the screen. Did you have any children while you were married, either of you or both? Well, I'll make my answer simple. I wasn't married in the polygamy group. I ran away before they could marry me off. So we'll let Susan answer her part. I did. I had five children. Um, I had five children by the time I was 23. And uh, when I ran away, I had to stink my children away. So um, it was quite an experience. And I am very blessed that they are free of it, that they all know Jesus as their personal Savior. And um, 
that we're out of polygamy. It's a wonderful feeling. And you have a good relationship with them all now. And I do. On a daily basis almost. And, and then a question that we've had asked um, several times in the past, and we're getting it again tonight. Why don't the police arrest the polygamists? You know, we had this question a couple of weeks ago, and I asked, answered it. Um, and the person who I answered it wasn't quite pleased with my answer. Next week, I'm going to spend quite a long time answering several questions that we haven't gotten to um, all of them, and that's going to be one of them. So I'm going to answer it more in full, hopefully to the satisfaction of those who have asked it in the past and didn't like uh, my incomplete answer that they thought it was. So if you don't mind if I pass this off until next week's show, uh, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, well, again, we're getting to the end of our time, Susan. Um, what would you right now quickly say to polygamous viewers, maybe a discontented wife or wives tonight, uh, maybe questioning their situation in a polygamy group, what would you say to them right now? I would say that if something doesn't seem right to you, then question it. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't have the right to question. Don't expect your husband to do the studying for you. Never, n never accept the, the answer that as long as you are a good wife, a good supportive wife and mother, that you will ride to heaven on your husband's coattails because it's not true. You have to answer for your own life. So study the Word of God. Get to know Jesus. Get to know who God was. Find out that He truly does love you that He wants you to be happy. He wants you to know Him in and of yourself. And then make your own choices. If you're in a situation that, you're, that you feel like is not uh, one that you want to be in, if you're in a polygamous relationship and you want out of it, there are ways to get out of it. Mm -hmm. I am so grateful that I was able to find freedom. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for being here tonight. It's been a, a wonderful pleasure. I wish we had more time. <laughs> Um, to, to there just isn't enough time to ask all the questions that we have. Uh, we hope you enjoyed your t our time uh, tonight with Susan also. And uh, next week we're going to study the priesthood, the priesthood with the FLDS community uh, based on the pre uh, compared to the priesthood of the Bible. And I want to remind our polygamous viewers that indeed God has spoken. He has said each man is to have his own wife and each wife is to have her own husband. And if you are having someone else's husband, if he has two or three wives, you don't have your own husband. And if you are happy, I'm glad you're happy, but that still isn't God's salvation plan. God's salvation plan is in the Bible, and you can find it there. As Susan said, study for yourself. Uh, when one man has seven wives, six men don't get a wife. And the Bible says each man is to have his own wife. Uh, also, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says that it is good not to marry. If it's good not to marry one, why is it good to marry many? And of course, Jesus put his stamp of approval on monogamy in Matthew 18, telling the two shall become one. And um, we don't understand how living polygamy can be a good thing based on the scripture and what it says. Thank you for coming tonight. We do appreciate your time with us. We hope you enjoyed it. Join us next week on Polygamy, What Love Is This? Good night. God bless.